Hello, everybody. This is the fifth lecture of uh, IPC, Integrated Pollution Control. And with this one, we move from uh, well, legislation stuff that is important for uh, work of engineers in this field to the fun stuff where creativity is coming up, innovative concepts and uh, well, things that uh, need a lot of development. So it's about zero emissions and cradle to cradle concepts, and we will dive right into it. So uh, now this old stuff of three dimensions of sustainability, uh, that was never really appealing to me, but unfortunately I've been, I never figured out what is wrong. So there is something completely flawed of this because how can you say that economy and ecology and the social have the same sort of importance uh, what this um, picture here is suggesting. So that's bullshit, of course. And uh, the more realistic view on things is that um, ecology is, well, the whole planet. This is uh, all there is that's all the system that is supporting life at all if ecology is uh, destroyed and that is happening on an incredible scale at the moment uh, then there will be no social because there will not be people anymore and uh, without people there will not be any economy uh, going uh, well the computers can run that for themselves maybe but uh, all these crazy things that are developing are not having uh, a solid base in uh, reality and um, in my point of view it's cooperation with nature or well we will not be part of uh, a nature anymore so yeah well inside ecology we have a field that is the social society and part of the social is the economy. So now we have set things right. Um, if we look at economy, um, we need to look at the situation. Is this part of economy we are looking at, specific branch, specific industry, is it useful for society? So if um, a specific industry is creating a lot of damage, uh, this type of industry cannot be tolerated. As simple as that. And we do have a lot of branches where the damage done is far bigger than the turnover of the company. But the damage is on uh, taxpayers, the damage is on nature, the damage is on coming generations. And this is completely unacceptable. And only because we are getting used to this nonsense, uh, this outrageous behavior, uh, that's not a justification. So let's be clear about that. Uh, is this specific industry integrating into ecosystems? If not, uh, it's likely that, well, there is no future for the system and it may produce a lot of damage. And one of the key questions, is this industry parasitic and this often goes hand in hand, corruption driven? Because like with corruption, um, there will be like acceptance by legislators, acceptance by politicians, by media uh, to run uh, corporations that are not useful for society. To the contrary, that are uh, putting a bit of a big burden on our development for the future. Uh, we should look at needs versus greeds. Uh, then do we look at toxic production or are products well designed 
And uh, now getting into the topic of, of this uh, lecture, zero emissions concepts, uh, does all waste turn into a new resource? And let's look where we can get there. So there is uh, one thought of um, one line of thought, and that is the cradle to cradle approach. This is, well, a term that is uh, legally protected uh, by the company EPEA. And uh, this is um, the well, idea behind it. We will go into more detail uh, towards the end of this lecture. To identify suitable materials in the development of a cradle-to-cradle -cradle product leads to redesign or a new product concept. And the cradle-to-cradle -cradle steps are identification of products and their constituent materials. So that can be pretty far-reaching, not only looking into the raw material that actually used, but into more detail about the well. The, the origin of those processes and so on. It's research on the ecological and toxicological data of the individual components or the parts thereof. Um, it's an evaluation of any dangers they present and specified scenarios and an estimation of overall risk of the material recommendations for safe handling of uh, pros, uh, products, and then a final classification with A, B, C, and an X. And this is good because the X, um, that's something where, uh, well, the, 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 the situation becomes uh, intolerable and uh, so that's great because like in conventional legislation uh, there is uh, mostly uh, well the, the thing well we minimize the emissions to a certain degree but uh, well if a production process for a specific product is not acceptable all in all there shouldn't be limitations of effluence or well, some legislation on that, but it should be marked as not, not acceptable, give that up, develop something that is behaving well and, and uh, complying with nature, complying with human health and so on. And that's a completely normal thing that should be in all legislation that should be absolutely uh, having a priority. And what we see in legislation, at least, is phasing out of very dangerous materials. Um, and the list is not all, not that long. The list of very dangerous substances is much, 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 much longer. And so we see that legislation is sort of lagging behind uh, for many kilometers or whatever. And the concept of cradle to cradle was um, developed by Professor uh, Michael Braungart from Leuphana University, Lüneburg, uh, not very far from Harburg. Uh, look at the work they are doing. It's, it's uh, very interesting. And um, it's something where we can well come to better production uh, by companies that are getting certified. And the downside of this is, of course, that only companies that ask for this certification will go through this. So that's limited to companies that want to do more. Uh, but that's good starting point. And I know of one project of uh, the Cradle to Cradle uh, uh, consultancy, uh, and that was to find out um, dyes for a textile. Uh, that can be proven to be harmless. And there are around 16,000 different dyes on the market. 16,000, just imagine um, how many colors are there. Uh, and so they researched um, which ones out of these 16,000 something 
uh, can be proven to be completely harmless in the environment. And guess what? I think it was around 16 or 18, something in this order of magnitude. And none of it was color black. So the black dyes are specifically toxic. Um, and uh, so the company that was doing this was a Swiss company making high quality, quality textile. And they even phased out black, even though it, it is one of the most wanted uh, color in, in textiles. Uh, so that's one example. And the, how they work is to make um, sort of an uh, assessment of, well, how well do the materials used integrate into the process. And it's like, like in nature where the waste of a tree is eaten by animal that makes dung and we have soil nutrients and these are taken up by the plant again. And so we have a cradle to cradle process here. And now if we come to, uh, well, this is cut off here, so that would be technical nutrients. It's a nice word, I like it. And this is applying the same concept. So a waste of, of this after the useful lifetime uh, can become food for the next and that means uh, also that we get to sort of uh, not just recycling to uh, some low quality material what is very often done so recycling is not often not very far reaching uh, but to come to something that is um, sort of um, well working out in the long run and um, they use uh, product uh, scorecards and um, this is the well, cradle to cradle trademark and uh, there is um, well the different layers what can be achieved so basic doesn't mean much but bronze silver gold and platinum and they look into material health material reutilization, renewable energy utilization, water stewardship, and social fairness. So that's pretty extensive. And towards the end of the lecture, I will go into some more detail here. So then there is another big um, school, and that's the thought of um, Gunther Pauli. Um, and, uh, Gunther has developed the um, concept of blue economy, but uh, he became really famous when he came up with the, uh, his ZERI initiative, Zero Emissions Research and Initiatives. And uh, I liked that very much at that time, and um, we did some work together. And uh, his books became really bestsellers, so he, he is selling in the millions. Uh, and um, the um, story of, of him is quite remarkable. So he um, used to be an entrepreneur in Belgium. He is Belgian originally, but lived around the world in many parts uh, and continents. And uh, he was co-owner of um, the company Ecover, that is well a big company today so you you see the products in most uh, health food stores and this company was pioneering to get away from synthetic um, detergents to nature-based detergents and they used palm oil a lot and um, so that business was going very very well and um, then uh, Gunther got invited to, um, well, receive uh, an award in Indonesia. 
And so he went there and thought, wow, this is great. So I've done something for this country. But once he understood what the background was, um, it was they gave him a big award because uh, their trade in palm oil had skyrocketed because not only his company, but also many others were following up. And um, so a lot of uh, rainforest was cut down for uh, palm oil uh, plantations uh, that often use excessive amounts of pesticides, herbicides and everything. And so he realized that this was a major flaw in his idea. And so because um, his fellow owner, co-owner didn't want to move, but thought, no, everything is going so well, let's go on with this. Um, Gunther decided to get out of his own company, sold his part to uh, the other owner. And then he developed the, the zero emissions concept because he said, all the materials we utilize should be utilized uh, to the best we can, so to minimize their um, utilization, to make new materials for um, from from the stuff that we have um, produced and used, and uh, to make um, well industry more like uh, the natural concepts. And so he brought out this idea and um, he, um, when he brought out this uh, idea in the, um, in, in the uh, public or in the well, arena of international organizations, he got an offer from uh, Japan and they told him, okay, we'll give you 10, 000, uh, 10 million uh, dollars, what was a lot of money at that time, uh, and uh, told him, okay, you can start developing this. Uh, the only prerequisite is that you move to Japan, uh, what he happily did. And so he lived in Japan for a long time and uh, worked there with the university and developed the zero emissions concept. And now uh, he's calling his um, development blue economy. And uh, the blue economy concept, um, uh, well, this is the some of the books. Uh, he sold one million copies of this one. And um, he was uh, selling a lot before even. And um, this is something where I um, think there is a big interest by many, many people into this direction. And this should translate into getting ahead, I think. So things go far too slowly. Um, but I think there is a lot of especially younger people that get it and that are absolutely committing themselves uh, to doing something good for society, something good for the future, and still have a good life, what is well possible. But I think you can't have a good life if you earn a lot of money with something that is more like killing children at the end of the day. And more and more people realize that. So the, the people that are scrupulous, they are sort of old school and hopefully uh, well, disappearing uh, from this wonderful earth. Yeah, and um, Gunter Pauli says that there is this uh, green industry and all that, that this is flawed in some way. And so um, he says that um, it is the, the, well, what he calls the, the Green is expensive, mostly subsidized, uh, goes with taxes and uh, cuts cost if possible. 
And then what he calls blue economy uh, is innovative, competitive, creates jobs and creates more value. So let's look into this a bit more. So principles of uh, blue economy, according to Gunter Pauli, uh, out of his book, I sh I've shown the books, the, the book before in the many languages they have appeared, but there is a lot of material in the internet. So have, have a look further if you like. And as always, if you really feel challenged to work in this field, ask us for doing a a project work or a master thesis. The best is always to combine, to make a, a project work, see if the topic is really good for you and uh, then you can go ahead with master thesis. So uh, some of the uh, principles. Respond to basic needs of all with what you have. Innovations inspired by nature generating multiple benefits, including jobs and social capital, offering more with less. Solutions are first and foremost based on physics. Deciding factors are pressure and temperature as found on site. So not so much going into chemicals and all that, but work with physical uh, solutions in the first place. Um, then substitute something with nothing, so make things easier and so on. Uh, question any resource regarding its necessity. Um, here's an important one. Natural systems cascade nutrients, matter and energy. Waste does not exist. Um, any byproduct is the source for a new product. Nature evolved from a few species to a rich biodiversity. Wealth means diversity, industrial standardization is the contrary. So this, well, one product only principle is very wasteful because these companies are not really uh, looking at all what they could do from uh, making better use of their raw materials and so a lot of waste is created. Um, gravity is the main source of energy. Solar energy is the second, second renewable fuel. Water is the primary solvent. No complex chemical toxic catalysts. Nature only works with what is locally available with respect for culture and tradition. Nature responds to basic needs and then evolves from sufficiency to abundance. That's one of the key things uh, and um, that's basically the same what, what um, uh, Michael, Michael Braungart is also saying. We don't need to restrict to the bare minimum. Let's do the right things where the material flows are working out and we can enjoy abundance. If we try to minimize to the minimum, um, then very often these systems don't work out. Nature in itself, the natural flows in nature are created around abundance. So um, a tree is producing so many seeds that it's like uh, feeding many other um, animals and and uh, still enough can go to into into fruition and form new trees and so on so that's uh, the, the principle of abundance and that's something I like to to look at it's not just well we are so bad and things are well not not available for everybody no if we create the right type of technologies uh, there is abundance for all and with all I mean even 10 billion and many more people on earth. Nature is working with abundance and we can go with nature and uh, enjoy and create the same abundance. Um, yeah, the, the present economic model relies on scarcity as a basis for production and consumption. And that's no fun. So it's like, um, and it doesn't make sense. It's not, not um, 
well, it's it's sort of a producing guilt with no good reason. We should make all production integrate with nature, and then it's not a question of uh, minimizing to to uh, an extreme where everybody thinks three times before uh, using anything. What doesn't mean that um, well wasteful behavior uh, should be uh, uh, normal. Natural systems are nonlinear. In nature, everything is biodegradable. Uh, there are a lot of toxic substances in nature, so they have stuff that is really plants can have stuff in it that kills animals, uh, but this stuff is all biodegradable. Um, then we do have um, in natural systems, everything is connected with symbiosis. So one thing serves many purposes. In nature, one process generates multiple benefits. Nature is efficient. Sustainable business maximizes use of available materials and energy, which reduces the unit price for the consumer. And down here is the source, uh, uh, www.thebluecommy.org. And this is as of 2017, but I think that hasn't changed much. All right, let's go on here. And um, I'll go back to the zero emissions principle and the practical methodology. And whether you call this uh, zero emissions or blue economy, I don't mind. Um, so one thing is that you normally do input output tables and this is even the conventional procedure like ISO 14001 and uh, uh, following and that's extensive work that needs to be done by law so there is let, um, legal pressure to do the this procedure and then uh, optimize uh, the process um, recycling uh, cleaner production and that's where the legislation is. That's what we learned in the uh, lectures about legislation, where uh, this is sort of the uh, part of well, uh, the legislation that is um, implemented. That's the um, well, the, the the principles of the IDE of EU integrated. Um, um, well, you, you know what I mean, the, the, the integrated uh, pollution control legislation uh, and its uh, specific uh, laws. And then the new thing is, and now this becomes highly interesting, output input tables. So what is that? <laughs> And it's basically a creative search for utilization of any waste, be it wastewater, off air, heat that is emitting, and uh, wastewater. Then another principle is clustering of industry or production units, waste of one input factor for the other. So that's the clustering that can be going a long way if you bring the right industries together from the beginning. So it's not the repair mechanism, but it's more uh, de uh, developing from scratch. Um, identification of innovative technologies and finding break breakthrough processes. Often things are only developed if somebody is looking for a solution. Uh, otherwise, everybody would think this is impossible. And this has been proven again and again and again. And of course, we need compliance with regulations and law. Innovative procedures can collide with old legislation, unfortunately. But the new legislation of uh, EU is uh, much better in this respect because it really can take into account through the 
system as we learned the flexibility is built in and so these things that are done in in this context that i'm showing here can be taken into account for giving permits for production and this here is from uh, Gunter Pauli's book Upsizing. He has written very many books. Uh, some are also in THH library. All right, so let's carry on. And we do have um, two basic pathways for uh, getting to maximum overall efficiency. Uh, so the conventional way would be the systems optimization. We have talked about this in the preceding lectures. Uh, improve the treatment, uh, go from uh, end of the pipe to source control systems, more reuse, uh, validation of resources, um, exchange energy and or raw materials with neighboring businesses. Uh, but there we do have a little bit of a problem because um, if the companies are just uh, developed without any uh, concern about which company could be sort of a good neighbor for another one by exchange of materials and energy, uh, this is something what is very restricted. Whereas with the blue economy design or zero emissions approach, uh, there would be a planning of a synergistic industry cluster from the beginning. So you can neighbor companies in a, in a good way. Then uh, you look intensively for output input connections and check all raw materials for their efficiency. And Probably um, this way would be difficult. So it's, it's probably um, question mark. Can we get there? There is a question mark here as well. Can we get there? Uh, but uh, the upside is these systems have been proven in quite a few uh, industries case studies and so it is possible uh, at least in principle not for every product and also not every product should, should be produced at all so uh, then an example of improving the system so that was the the upper part of the last slide um, water consumption in industry has been lowered very strongly so um, basically industry has come down by an around 80 or 90 percent um, in the water consumption what is really huge so it's not to 80 90 percent but by 80 90 percent so industry today does only require for the same production 10 or 20 percent of the water they used to use so that old industry was very very wasteful to turn that argument around so here an example of uh, professor cornell and paper industry within 15 to 20 years came from 50 to 70 cubic meters per ton of paper produced with a maximum of above 100 uh, down to 15 to 20 cubic meters per ton and minimum even below 10. Another example from pharmaceutical companies over 10 years from 6 to 2 million cubic meters per year with a high reduction of the pollution loads. So there are many, many, many success stories. So, so industry has developed quite a bit to the better, um, even though that's from a very, very low standard to something that is now still not good, but um, by far better than uh, the lousy um, type of production that uh, used to be in place and still is in place in uh, quite a few areas around the world. Okay, 
then uh, we still have over 10,000 substances in water bodies and uh, this is especially an unbearable load in developing countries. So the situations we, we see in areas in um, South India or uh, parts of China and so on, this is, uh, or Thailand, uh, this is absolutely incredible. And well, the word developing countries doesn't apply anymore. It's, it's specific regions that are sort of not really uh, putting up high standards so that the, those are uh, well, profiting from very, very cheap production with putting very high um, well, external externalities to the countries where they are producing and uh, this is unacceptable. Then uh, one example of uh, bottle washing with a closed loop water system. So um, if you have, uh, well, the, the bottle um, reuse, um, then you need to do the different steps, uh, emptying the residues, softening, leaching one, leach spraying, hot water, water spraying, water spraying, and final uh, water spraying. And now, of course, you could have uh, water input from all these places of uh, fresh water, uh, but of course that doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's get this away. And uh, what is done is that we, we do have um, only one water supply that goes in and then it's cascading from one to another uh, because in all the different steps we need uh, certain water qualities and uh, like at the beginning, you, you can imagine if you have a first uh, cleansing of uh, a bottle, uh, this would be, um, well, relatively simple. So you could just um, leave some of the final rinse of the last bottle and then use this for the, the next step and so on and so so that's something that is making a lot of sense this would be the cascading of water use so that already goes a long way reduces water demand by far and it's a standard in many many branches many many production units because it's so logical now if we look um, one step Further, we would go into installing a, a reverse a microfiltration unit, reverse osmosis unit, and produce basically the part of the fresh water by the company itself. So only very little needs to come in. Some losses are always there. And so that would be a step ahead in efficiency. All right, so this is just a, just a little example. And um, now I want to go into the um, like principles of innovation. Um, there is something what is called innovation research. And um, there is the three dimensions of uh, innovation. One is the technical innovation. Well, there's too little contrast here. Let me take another color. Technical innovation, that's the normal stuff, what is normally considered innovation. So to improve efficiency of a process by 5%, 2%, so the margin gets lower and lower and lower. Uh, then we do have um, the formal innovation, and that would be how a product is designed. So it could be looking like this, 
or it could look like this. Um, and so that would be the, the formal. It's more, more or less the design and, and things like this. And uh, then the forgotten part, the most interesting, uh, is really to go into uh, concept innovation. So that means we get away from what we have done and use completely different approaches. And that can actually go a very, very long way because that's where uh, not only improvement by 2%, 5% is possible, but a completely different story with uh, uh, being by far better, making better products and so on. So that's the interesting part. And we will have some examples for that. So to the obstacles for uh, extensive eco-efficiency, um, technical limitations have become less important because more technology is available. However, economic limitations are quickly reached. Most customers buy by price and of course that means the lowest price. <clears throat> Few buy by eco-efficiency. So this would be rather a marketing subgroup for people that are more engaged. And not all what is sold in that well, sector is also really making a lot of sense. Sometimes it's more marketing than reality what they are selling. Shareholder companies do often focus on short term results. Um, then, um, and short term results can be really uh, even, um, well, avoiding doing something that makes a lot of sense. I told you the example when I worked for a big chemical company as a consultant for, well, I had, had one contract with them at the time. And besides the uh, dynamic modeling computer simulation of their wastewater, central wastewater treatment plant, I saw that one cubic meter per second was sort of rushing down for 20 meters and not used. So I made a little uh, suggestion calculating how much energy could be gained by this uh, one uh, cubic meter per second. That's a lot. That's a medium, a sm small to medium sized river. Um, and uh, 20 meters is quite a waterhead. And it would have um, started to pay off after around i think it was one and a half years or one one year three months and when i went to the next meeting i i said wow i have something here this is great it pays off in in, in just a bit over a year and expected that they would go for it instead they told me oh no this costs us money in this quarter and um so only takes more than a year no we are not interested at all and this type of thinking is sort of destroying the economic base in the long run. If you avoid everything, what is sort of needing a bit of investment, but being of an advantage at a later point, this is sort of uh, robbing the company of value. And um, a way out would be uh, contracting so that a company would uh, be called, that would be running the hydroelectric uh, power system there and the company wouldn't have to pay. They would get a uh, sort of, well, a rate, good rate for electricity, for example. Um, and so they wouldn't really uh, put a burden on their monthly or their, their quarterly reports to the shareholders. And so they could go for that. So that's called contracting and is a very, very interesting business. So, um, competitive advantages for zero eco products, um, and I mean this in uh, parenthesis, uh, those that are really destroying the environment. <clears throat> um, competitive 
advantages for customers who do not care and uh, the media is profiting from advertisement so they will not really uh, be likely to put uh, bad behavior of companies into their uh, papers or on TV and so that's what is protecting this uh, zero eco type of production uh, but good concepts with a high overall efficiency can have significant economic benefit uh, but to the but that is often not sufficient because external costs must be added to production for fair play. It is something that is unacceptable that um, companies that are destroying ecosystems, destroying the health of people are not held accountable for that, that they don't have to pay for the damage, uh, but they can just profit from uh, our crazy economy where uh, the, the lowest price uh, makes uh, a lot of turnover uh, even if it's uh, well very very bad for society okay so further on downsides of globalization why do people with a good salary and living in a clean environment have to buy the cheapest products that are produced for a starvation wage while industries are poisoning humans and the environment. Why is that? That's absolutely crazy. It's neglect uh, and only because people often are not happy, not content with their life. They are just going with everything that is uh, done. Um, and so this is um, something that should be stopped. Then um, either compensation of regional high quality production, so they would get a benefit, or we would have a global fairness through including external cost. So then we can have this and uh, so doesn't go this way, unfortunately. And if like EU does fantastic legislation and banning many things that are harmful, but production in um, some Southeast Asian uh, regions are going on like with a lot of pollution and uh, not taking care of anything, creating a big, big damage uh, to the population and to our planet, uh, how can they be winning in the market? This is crazy game, crazy play, and, and uh, this is the downside of globalization. One of the upsides is that we can communicate around the world, we can learn from each other, and so also in the regions where production is still bad, some things are improving, and so on. All right, so um, now there is a, well, quite some interest in local production. So there is, uh, for example, over many decades, uh, beer brewing companies, so, so the beer production was getting more and more uh, concentrated to very, very few companies. If, even if the brands are different on, the bottles, but there's uh, very few big companies are behind almost all breweries. And so there are many pioneers now that are, um, well, starting uh, small local breweries, for example, and they are very successful. So people are cherishing local production and it's the creativity um, they have uh, the advantage that they don't need to put uh, so much preservatives into their uh, product because it's uh, delivered locally and doesn't have a shelf life for decades. Now to the input output table and we stay with uh, beer production 
And uh, so here we have inputs, water, malt, and yeast. And um, on the side of the outputs, um, we do have beer, water, that would be wastewater, spent grain, and CO2 is produced. So now, that's the conventional way. Um, and this is very, very, very simple example. Of course, in most industries, this looks, looks a lot more complex. And so if we look at that, um, water makes beer, grain makes spent grain, and it's normally given away to farmers for free, so not really creating value or landfill. And now this is once again the core business, brewery. They say, we make beer, nothing else. Uh, but what if, and that was one of the first big success stories of Gunter Pauli's Zeri organization, that was to look into uh, working with all five kingdoms of nature. There are bacteria, a lot is done with them, algae, a lot less, but a lot of potential is there. But then the um, kingdom of fungi, it's hardly used, so a lot more can be done. Uh, if, if you're interested in what can be done from, from fungi, uh, check the work of uh, Paul Stamets. Absolutely great. He's everywhere on the internet. Great presentation, so it's really fun to, to listen to him. And he's really based in good science and does a lot of stuff. So fungi is the forgotten kingdom. And of course, a lot is done with plants and with animals. And the idea of Zeri is to work with all of the kin kingdoms. And now, if we look at the brewery, this would mean that we make an output input table. Input here is now the wastewater. So this is your wastewater. And look what can be done. So some treatment, 10%. Aquaculture, so some of the flows are suitable for aquaculture. <clears throat> Algae ponds, use for irrigation, and so on. And so that would total a hundred percent. So aquaculture would take the lion's share here from the wastewater. Then we have the um, spent grain. So what is done with that? Some can be used in the aquaculture. So another advantage, you can cultivate mushrooms with this. You can use this also for earthworm production. And so that once again makes a hundred percent. Now it becomes trickier because these processes once again are producing something. So we do it all over again. We take the output of this as input of this one. And so off we go. So we can like look for many, many products. And to, to cut this short, the story short, I, I think you get the idea. Um, we can look for the Zeri brewery that actually has been built. Uh, so water makes the beer. Grains make spent grain. Wastewater goes to pigs. Um, the um, waste goes of the pigs goes to digester makes biogas feeds an algae pond a fish pond and um, then with the spent grains that's substrate for mushroom cultivation and i mean um, the edible ones not the micro mushrooms um, and then once again, we do have more spent substrate, feeds the pigs. Some of the spent grain is used for bread. So you can add around 
10% of spent grain to bread, tastes nice, adds fibers, what makes it also more healthy. And now instead of one core product, uh, this company makes beer. Uh, it produces mushrooms, so incomes. Uh, then pigs are raised, there will be biogas, uh, there will be fish produced, uh, you can take out algae um, and with that we have contribution to bread production. And so the beer is still there, but it's not the only product. Uh, and this was built initially in um, Namibia, uh, the country in southern Africa. And this is a picture of the uh, Zeri Brewery. Uh, here is where they have the, the beer. Um, and they had the, um, um, the idea to protect their um, clients from preservatives, so they didn't add preservatives. Um, instead, they took back beer that was going bad and added this um, into the um, algal ponds and made value of that. So the people could give back the beer for free that was spoiled because they had other uses for that. And um, the, um, well, idea was um, taking back spoiled beer was a good one, but it unfortunately didn't work out in the long run. So too much was going bad and too much was returned. And so the, the viability of the uh, brewery was not uh, working out anymore. Uh, but luckily they had established a mushroom production. And so the mushrooms became a good product. Also uh, the fish they were producing. So they sti still had business, even though the beer production was, uh, was defaulting. All right, so that's the idea to have many different products. So this can be applied in many different fields and uh, it's not always so easy. So, so it looks so easy, but it's difficult to, to get there. So, yeah, this is um, the production of um, fungi, edible uh, mushrooms, and they produced mushrooms in the desert with these uh, plastic bags and um, for mushroom production moisture is is important and so you can have the moisture in here even if it's extremely dry outside so that's something what is great but you need the substrate and so they had to have the substrate uh, initially from the beer production, but they found different substrate. So one main thing to, to know is that uh, the kingdom of uh, fungi is meant to degrade woody material. So decaying wood and, and woody materials are ideal for uh, growing uh, mushrooms and the stuff you cannot use from, from wood that is decaying is broken up by mushrooms and thus made accessible to other um, kingdoms of nature. All right, so then uh, one word on agrochemical industry. Uh, this would be a word about a parasitic business model. So, it's an absurd fight against nature. Does not make any sense at all, except saving on labor. In a negative notion, you could say, makes jobs disappear. And millions and hundreds of millions of jobs have disappeared through industrialization of agriculture. And at the same time, uh, polluting the groundwater and, and so on. Uh, destroys soil life and pollutes the groundwater, makes insects and birds disappear. Chronic illness is rampant. 
partly due to uh, pesticide residues uh, that are eaten by the product, that are spread out by air and uh, so on, and through the groundwater. Um, and um, if this is stopped, farmers can earn more money. And um, the thing that this is really parasitic is that the farm itself is destroyed by industrial agriculture. The soils are uh, not surviving this for more than a few decades. Many soils around the world are um, destroyed. And this is uh, one of the root sources for climate change, uh, because like if soil is destroyed on a large uh, scale, there is uh, like no good infiltration of water anymore. In rainy seasons, water is just running off. Region is drying out, no more rain, less water. So that's a downward spiral towards destruction, towards local climate change. And ultimately, as this is happening around the world, uh, one third of all uh, arable land is destroyed already. This results in climate change. And this is a major part of the many root causes for climate change. But some are not really uh, so popular to address because you get attacked and media are not too keen on getting uh, angry calls from uh, mighty companies. Um, so um, the thing is that in like this parasitic industry, the best would be it would be converted to something different and that would be possible and um, so another uh, industry that is destructive is uh, well the so-called uh, bioenergy that is not bio at all it's, it's agrochemical production with heavy pollution of groundwater the atmosphere um, and it produces ridiculously small amounts of energy. So the net energy balance is really lousy. And if you calculate the soil destruction, the uh, environmental destruction does not make sense any, any, um, not, not any sense at all. And it adds to starvation around the world. There are almost a billion people starving around the world while it would be very, very easy to grow enough food for many, many more people. So alone industrial uh, animal keeping, uh, those animals are fed with, um, well, what could be human food and that would feed 70 billion people. So if anybody tells you there are too many people on earth, uh, that's ridiculous. There are too many people on Earth that don't care. That's true. They should be uh, well stopped by society, uh, by uh, running parasitic uh, industries or doing destructive business, because they don't have to pay for the externality, uh, externalities. All right, then um, how can we do better? And that's surprisingly simple in the field of agriculture. So there's something that is called regenerative agriculture. And I'm promoting this since a couple of years. Farmers are very, very interested now. Many farmers are looking for new ways because the old ways are uh, well, leading to uh, well, bankruptcy for, for many. Uh, and the principles are no tilling, um, so not not to plow the soil because the uh, the, the soil uh, fungi are destroyed and soil fungi are the main uh, well producing uh, species when it comes to activation of uh, the elements from the soil. Cover soil with green manure with legumes, and if you have legumes. The nitrogen is produced by the plant, but not from a factory that needs a lot of energy. So we get this all for free. And uh, some, some people have t 
talked farmers into buying something that they can get for free with simple, simple methods. And uh, unfortunately, universities have helped with that. Otherwise, that wouldn't have gone so bad. Um, and then there is principal direct seeding, putting in animals in rotational grazing, uh, maximize diversity. Agroforestry is a very, very uh, good way and you can include leg, uh, leguminous trees. Once again, this is your uh, nitrogen factory, while uh, mycorrhiza fungi can activate a lot of the phosphate and other elements. And uh, building humus means manifold higher water uptake and water retention. So making agriculture a lot more prone to uh, a lot less prone to drought and flooding. And well, it's mitigating against climate change. So conversion of agrochemical industry into life supporting products with full mineralization. And this will be done by a society that get its, gets its wits together because what is going on at the moment is the destruction of our planet, the destruction of humanity, and unfortunately, the destruction of humankind is very, very profitable still, while other ways are profitable for those that are doing the work. All right, so options for zero emissions and full reuse in water management. I'll just go briefly through this. Um, you also find an extensive lecture of mine um, in my YouTube channel, the public one about um, sanitation, Nexus Engineering Sanitation, but I will give just a few hints what can be done in the field of water management. So the real water consumption uh, including virtual water, and virtual water is not virtual at all, it's just water that comes from elsewhere in the production process, because many of the production units are not all that water efficient yet. And so the water consumption in Germany and in most other places around the world with high, produ uh, high consumption patterns is 4,000 liters per person and day. And what we really consume is 125. So um, this makes um, a huge, huge, huge impact in many parts of the world, especially in dry areas. Um, Water efficiency must look at consumption of food and other products too. And that's why production is so important in many aspects, also the water efficiency. So if we have a city, we get water, food, energy, solid waste, wastewater. There is another city, we have a problem. And this means that the Conventional sanitation that we find around the world is made up from linear mass flows. So the nutrients and food goes into the city. The remaining stuff goes into wastewater systems and a lot of them that goes into the rivers, a lot into landfills, incineration, and some goes back to the land, but that's a minor part and it's not really so well plant accessible. So flush sanitation has broken the nutrient cycle and rivers are well receiving a lot of uh, waste uh, still even with wastewater treatment plants, lots of pharmaceutical residues and so on. And this goes into the well drinking water supply of the uh, city downstream. Now industry, as we have learned, has moved from the end of the pipe towards having units per production site, recycling the water and having a lot less wastewater. And this pays out even economically. 
Can the same work in housing areas? And it can. So we have to look at gray water and toilet wastewater separately. And then we can achieve something where the, the loops really work out. So our input output, output input would fit together. So toilet systems are crucial for that. So to separate this, this is always the most important step. Just like in industry, you separate different uh, qualities of wastewater, highly concentrated uh, versus uh, low pollution wastewater. In households, it's the, the toilet wastewater and the rest of it. And actually urine and feces are only very, very small uh, volumes compared to the whole big water consumption. So a lot of water can be saved and so on. Um, and different types of toilets. I've worked a lot with vacuum toilets initially, separation toilets from Sweden mainly, composting dry toilets. And we have recently start, or, well, started to develop systems with uh, container toilets. And also closed loop system was um, researched a lot. <clears throat> at my institute, it has been proven uh, feasible. So that's uh, the um, um, well, an example for concept innovation versus improvement of the old systems. Improvement of existing systems, improving the wastewater treatment plants, add another treatment step. <clears throat> but getting away from this completely would really mean to go for such uh, closed loop systems or the container toilets. And um, this is uh, the example of my early work. So I have built this um, around um, 20 years back. And this is a housing estate that is uh, having separation of uh, toilet wastewater and the rest of the um, well wastewater that we call gray water. Uh, water consumption down to 65 liters per capita day. And uh, these houses do have uh, vacuum toilets and that is connected to a biogas plant. And the idea was originally to produce liquid fertilizer. Legislation went another way, so this is not really possible anymore, but the system is still up and running and it's copied by many. So in the Netherlands, quite a few were built in China. And uh, Hamburg Water has made a much bigger one, 10 times as big as the one that I developed for Lübeck. And they have made some improvements to produce more energy by the system. And this is built in um, or called uh, Hamburg Water Cycle. And uh, it's built in uh, Jenfeld, part of Hamburg. Jen. This is a J, Jenfeld. And um, so um, another system, and by the way, there's another one built that is even bigger in, in Sweden. And the business is now done by a Dutch company because we didn't get much support in Germany. And uh, well, now Dutch uh, people who were getting it they are now doing the business um, also in sweden and they also did consultancy in hamburg and so on but that's only fair so those that are really doing things in the right way they should go ahead with that um, and um, the system that um, yeah has quite a few upsides against the one that i developed is the one that was developed by ulrich braun so once again, it's always the separation of uh, black water and gray water. The black water is treated, makes new flush water, and just, just like that, we can produce water. So more and more products, all that is uh, earning money. And uh, so the whole system is also producing compost and fertilizer and so on. So, okay, I'll jump through this um, and 
then uh, the system I like most, and that's one that can be uh, a model for the world, and that is from the Amazon, where they lived uh, in cooperation with nature very successfully over thousands of years, obviously. And um, it was discovered that in specific regions there are these so called black soils, terra preta. And um, this was, well, it was found out that it was composed of bio waste, of uh, excreta and bones and stuff, um, garden clippings and so on. And so, um, all these people left after thousands of years with a population of many millions are beautiful ceramics and the best soils in the world. And now imagine our society with all these, uh, well, solid waste dumps with nuclear waste that is well, lasting for a millennia uh, partly and uh, look at how good we could get. And their sanitation system was really improving soil from this to that. And um, that was also the addition of some charcoal. And their toilet system was probably, uh, according to Dr. Piplo, uh, such tanks that have been sitting in the in the ground and See, leaching out some of the contents and from that they made these uh, good soils with addition of some charcoal and we have uh, now developed a system that can <clears throat> make this more comfortable so that would be a container toilet and once a week this would be uh, taken out lactic acid fermentation allows for uh, smell free operation uh, you need a, a sugar source for that waste sugar that can be and then this can produce uh, good soil and it would also work in uh, well, multi-story houses and there would be a tank underneath and a tanker truck could carry that away and the bio waste could also go in there so multi-purpose system Unfortunately, there is very little interest in that. It's a pressing system around the world for many, many people, many children, millions of people are having compromised health. Millions of pe uh, children especially die from uh, these waterborne diseases because fecal matter in rivers is unacceptable. And it would be so simple to change that. Political will is not there. So most people seem to be driven um, by uh yeah other things um the charcoal could be obtained by uh wood gas technology and wood gas is uh, a, well the most and maybe only sustainable bioenergy and could go well with agroforestry systems all right so also there is a lot of energy so also re reutilization of energy would be a, a good way using less warm water, heat recovery near source, producing biogas, energy equivalent of the urine, uh, uh, fertilizer production is enormously energy consuming that could be avoided. Uh, excreta could go for uh, soil improvement, um, soil amendment systems, compost to restore the humus. And so uh, plenty of energy would be there energy recovery would be simple and nobody seems to care so these things are not really done uh, but now back to <clears throat> industry uh, now the strategies of zero emissions versus recycling systems and um, this is where we do have um, well I'm, I'm going through quickly but but well I know that you can stop the video anytime and take a break, take some thoughts or well, go forward if something is boring to you. Uh, maybe speed 125 would make it easier to keep attentive. I don't know. I have people I listen to 
where I put speed to 125, uh, single people even to 1.5, because then it becomes more, well, interesting to listen. Uh, well, but however, this is how I speak and uh, hope this well, does the job. Um, now, zero emissions or recycling? Recycling is a measure to solve problems. It's not a long-term strategy. Mostly we have downcycling. And a future strategy would be zero emissions. Uh, so for recycling, uh, it is inefficient. 70% uh, after de-inking. We get toxic sludge. We have cost intensive um, operation due to wastewater and sludge treatment. And the products are of minor quality, even though there is recycling paper that is pretty white and strong, uh, that is recycling from very good paper quality directly, but from like uh, the scrap that people put into the bins, the, the quality is low. And especially uh, personal care products shouldn't be from recycled paper. So that's something what is sort of um, an, an, uh, a health issue. Um, now, compared to this recycling strategy, we can go for the zero strategy. Um, and that would be 100% recycling of ink, 100% utilization and low cost. How could that be done? Um, there is um, spe specific inks that can be reused for printing or writing. It should be long fibers uh, and they should be uh, well reprocessed in a clean way. Short fibers and coating uh, chemicals might be reused as construction material additives and so on. Um, industry cluster uh, paper, ink for printing or writing, construction materials, packaging could be businesses that are going along. Uh, feasibility depends on separation of ink and fiber. And there is a promising technology that's vapor explosion. And um, this is something where suddenly you could, uh, well, separate ink and paper and you would not have this well, relatively inefficient and not very satisfactory recycling process. Um, now, uh, another way, pathway for paper, this is what Gunther Pauli calls the paper of the future. And uh, this is that there is millions of tons of crushed stones that are often not usable. And so, you can make paper from stone, paper made from stone. And uh, this is one example of uh, like finding new concepts. Once again, uh, this is concept innovation versus improvement of existing processes. Um, this would be pulverized mixed with PET that can be uh, reused again and again. It's tree free, water free, 100% recyclable forever. Uh, and this can uh, free up land for farming. This is an example for products. So this is made from rock and a, well, single additive that makes it recyclable forever. Um, so another example of uh, well, zero emissions concept is uh, forestry, perfume, pigments and preservatives. And um, forestry is merely for making timbers. Branches, leaves and needles are rarely used. Um, Several types of trees can be used for production of high quality perfumes, natural preservative and many pigments from proteins and the leaves. Um, 
one ton of green mass results in four to eight liters of essential oils and preservatives, monetary value up to 200 euros from one ton green mass. Uh, natural perfumes are rarely allergi allergic. Uh, that's increasing the market share because so many people have problems with allergies. Uh, decentralized distilling can use branches bark for energy production because the process consumes a lot of energy. And that could be wood gas technology producing um, well charcoal uh, from well local resources while production is going, not the wasteful processes that are usually applied. Uh, this example again is from uh, Gunter Pauli's book uh, Breakthroughs. Uh, we also have to evaluate the effects of um, this on ecosystems, of course. So if the green material is uh, taken out of the forest, uh, this can mean that the, um, the land is not regenerating very well. So this production um, should consider humus building. And that's, uh, there may always be some um, unwanted side effects. And this is true for a lot of the uh, production uh, from straw and other uh, presume, presumed waste materials, because they are not waste, but they are feeding the humus. So in order to keep uh, soils healthy, these materials need to be put back into the soil, but it could be like making products that are also leading um, to like soil um, um, soil uh, feeding in the in the long run. Then uh, sugar detergents, water softener, compostable plastics. This is now from the book uh, Blue Economy uh, of Gunter Pauli. Um, so, sugar, mass produced article with oversupply, price decline, uh, problems with agrarian states because the income is not high enough to cover the uh, real costs. Plenty of patents for sugar utilization due to the price decline in the 60s. It was not continued, so these patents are free now. Uh, since prices increased, there is now free utilization. Um, detergents. Good detergents can be produced by sugars. Um, alkyl polyglucose can be replaced, can replace fossil resources. The manufacturing chain would be better than with coconut oil. Uh, it is degradable and has the ability of mineralization. And this is a big thing. So mineralization is really the key word for integrating into nature. Water softener Citrex is an alter alternative to phosphates uh, softeners and uh, should be important for the water reuse in future. Plastics can be uh, distilled from ethylene and um, it is polar, uh, polymerizable to polyethylene, fermentable to raw materials for plastic. So, um, to uh, get back to the cradle cradle to cradle concept there are some similar sim, uh, similarities but it's like it's a different pathway um, the cradle to cradle um, this organization or consultancy company um, this is producing product scorecards and they are looking for material health 
material reutilization, renewable energy, water stewardship and social fairness, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. And now for the final part of the lecture, so this is only going a few minutes more, um, I will show you a bit what this means. So we will start looking into material health. So this is um, part of the cradle to cradle uh, certification procedure. Uh, so they have the bronze, silver, gold, platinum standard and uh, no banned chemicals uh, are present above threshold and uh, materials defined as biological or technical nutrients. 100% uh, of all materials are characterized so the company knows what it's dealing with. So this is sort of necessary for all the levels, even basic. Um, then a strategy developed to optimize all remaining X assessed chemicals. X means uh, not basically not acceptable. And uh, so that's getting the client a little bit further into the bronze region. At least 75% uh, of the assessed weight um, is uh, well known in the complete formulation information. So that you know the uh, impact on the biosphere. Uh, and so then the for the um, higher standards still silver, gold, platinum, um, the um, assessed materials do not contain carcinogenic, mutagenic or reprodu reproductively toxic materials. Um, and this is something that is uh, sort of more far reaching. And uh, if that is for all materials used by the company that is going to gold or platinum and so on. So they, you get the idea. So this is what they call material health. Then we go into material reutilization and uh, defined um, the appropriate cycle for the product uh, designed or manufactured for the technical or biological cycle um, is part of the, the better assessment designed or manufactured for the technical or biological cycle and has a material reutilization score above 50 percent uh, above 65 percent and uh, a well-defined nutrient management strategy, including scope, timeline, budget for developing the logistics and recovery systems for this class of product or material. This gets you to gold or platinum. And this is ongoing. I don't go through all of those. You can stop the video if you want to have a further read or go into the paper itself. The uh, slides for this lecture will be uploaded so you can go in there and um, have the link uh, or look for cradle to cradle you, you, you will find these materials. Then renewable energy and carbon management, uh, the electricity, uh, renew, renewable energy usage and 5% uh, renewable energy gets you higher, 50% gets you to gold or platinum. And the final, for the final manufacturing stage of the product, 100% of purchased electricity is a renewable energy source uh, or offset with renewable energy uh, projects and, and so on. And that's getting into platinum. Um, then water stewardship, uh, the manufacturer, manufacturer has not received a significant violation of their discharge permit related to their product within the last two years. Um, so that's looking for compliance with legislation. And um, then uh, 
local business specific water related issues are characterized. Uh, the manufacturer will determine if there is water scarcity, uh, sensitivity in ecosystems and so on. So that's all basic for, for all. And um, for going a step further, this is facility-wide water audit is completed. And yeah, this is this all is some work. So it's like not everybody come every every company does that. Uh, but through these certifications, they can have a, an advantage in the market, and that means they can um, well maybe sell more of the product even if it has a, a, a pri price that is reflecting the better production. All right, so these are quite a few more. And to conclude, uh, number five on the scorecards is um, the social fairness. And the basic is a streamlined self-audit is conducted to assess protection of fundamental human rights. Management procedures aiming to address and identify issues have been provided. A full social responsibility self-audit is complete and a positive impact strategy is developed based on the UN Global Compact. Um, and then material specific and or issue related audit and certification relevant to minimum of 25% of the product uh, is completely and that is if they use uh, fair trade products this is getting them to the better levels um, yeah and this is also including the supply chain and this is very important because a lot of materials are imported from far away and so they will take the responsibility for, for those pro processes as well so with that being said, uh, so that leads, leads to the uh, product scorecard. So we have gone through these points here. And um, as I said, the link, link is here. You can see it in the, in the files that are on STUD IP. Um, with these um, certifications, uh, this is engineering work and uh, so it's it's one way of well improving the environment by setting standards by by certifying companies that are doing better to give them a better standing in the market and so on and it's an interesting field so those of you are uh, that, that are interested um, go for it project work master thesis whatever and um, with that i think there are quite a few options to find a good job so consider working to improve industry and i thank you for your attention bye bye